All right. Well, we spent quite a bit of time the last several sessions just looking at poetic devices, figurative language, and, and other devices that are used in Hebrew poetry. And uh, just to become familiar with those, because again, you, you will actually see those devices all over the Bible, not just in Psalms or uh, poems, but many other places as well. I see uh, examples in the Gospels and the Epistles. And so it's, it's helpful to, to be able to recognize them and to know, as we've discussed before, uh, whether a passage is literal or figurative or a statement in the passage, because we, it can end up in very wrong interpretation if we don't recognize a text as figurative or literal, and we assume it's the opposite. So um, I want to shift gears change a little bit today and, and kind of now now that we've had sort of this foundation and background understanding uh poetic devices understanding poetry and parallelism and structure and imagery and all the things that we've talked about those those are really a, a foundation to um, allow us to now pursue uh looking at how do we study them um poetic book or a book that contains poetry. So I want to focus mm -hmm. our attention on that today and actually uh, look at the Psalms in particular in regards to this, this topic. But as we consider the process for studying poetry, it's actually very, very similar to what we have looked at for narratives and epistles where we have a, we study the book as a whole first, certain aspects, and then we do the looking how we, we approach a particular passage. And so we'll, we're going to go through these things and see how specifically they apply to poetry. But many of the steps are exactly the same or very, very similar. All right. The one additional step that we have in the process is the poetic analysis. All right. We've already learned about really what how to what to do for that or what the elements are that we're looking for so we'll we'll give a special attention to that as we as we go through but first let's begin where we should always begin if we are studying a particular passage in a book we want to make sure that we read the entire book and make observations just as we talked about with an epistle or a narrative is we want to be familiar with the entire book uh, before we address a particular passage within the book. Um, I've used the analogy before. I don't know if I've mentioned to you guys, but you know you can think of sort of a, a studying a book of the Bible like a puzzle. So have you guys done puzzles before? I think I have a puzzle around here. I don't know where I put it. Um, and Imagine yourself with a puzzle. So I give you a box, but there's no picture on the box. It's just a plain brown box. And inside are 1,000 pieces of a puzzle. But you have no idea what the picture is. So how, <clears throat> how easy do you think it would be to put that puzzle together? All right, you pull out a piece and you go, I have no idea where this goes because I don't understand the picture. <clears throat> well, it's... It's the same or very similar when you study a book of the Bible. Um, if you have an idea of the book as a whole, if you know the whole picture, then each piece, each passage in the book, you'll have a much better idea of how that fits into the book as a whole. And so you can think of a book of the Bible like, like a puzzle. And if you understand the purpose of the book, the book overall, the structure, the, the flow of thought, the outline, that's that's like having a picture of the puzzle. So you say, ah, okay, I, I can see the big picture. Maybe not clearly everything, but I have an idea. And then when you pick up a piece, when you look at a passage, you'll have a, an easier time knowing how it fits in the puzzle. And so in the same way, we want to understand the book as a whole first before we focus on any particular part of the book. I remember learning this lesson the hard way when I was preaching through Jonah. 
And I didn't really study the book as a whole because, you know, everybody knows the story of Jonah, right? We're very familiar with that. So I thought, I, I'm familiar with it. So I just started, I preached through chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, you know, focusing on Jonah, the disobedient prophet and, you know, all these things. And then when I got to chapter four, as I was studying chapter four, preparing a message, I realized I missed the point of the whole book. Um, like, oh. This book isn't really focused on Jonah. It's focused on God. And Jonah was getting in the way of what God wanted to do. It's focused on his compassion. And so, uh, but I didn't realize that until I studied that last chapter. Because really the point of the book is given in the very last verse. When God said, should I not have compassion? And every, then when I realized that, I realized how every part of the book fit under that purpose, that theme of God's compassion. So I had to go back to the congregation and tell them uh, I, I missed the point of the book, so I have to re-preach this. So, uh, uh, but it taught me a good lesson that I should, I should understand the book as a whole before I go in and teach any part of it. And so these first three steps in the mm -hmm. process of studying uh, a passage really starts begins with the book that that passage is found in and so that's why we have here in these particular steps these first three steps are focused on the book and the first thing we should do is to read through the book understand the book make observations um, look for specific things the author the recipients people mentioned places mentioned well, when was the book written do we know why the book was written? Mm -hmm. What prompted the author? Um, th those kinds of things. And most books, we can find that information from the book. Now, not every book of the Bible, we don't know the author to every book of the Bible. Um, we usually know the recipients, but we, we can know much about the author's concerns from the book. And within the book, we can usually tell what, what, prompted the author to write it what is his purpose what is the structure of the book uh, we can usually identify around when the book was written there's a few books that that's hard to do but but most we can determine that mm -hmm. and so this kind of information helps us to understand the book we'll talk about background in a moment but the first thing is okay i gotta read through the book and read through it several times uh pastor pastor john uh, MacArthur says he likes to read through a book 30 times before he actually begins uh, begins studying through each passage. So mm -hmm. that's easy to do if you're looking at the book of Jonah. But if you're studying, you know, the Gospel of John or the book of Genesis, that that's a can be a challenge. But he what he would do is just each day. So he would start, uh, you know, more than a month before if he knew, OK, next month I'm preaching through the uh, book of Exodus. So he would start reading through the book um, each day, at least a month ahead of time. And then, so by the time he started preaching from the book or studying the book to preach, he had a very good idea of the passage. And so I, I, I'm trying to do that as well. I, I, 30 times is a lot, but, uh, you know, epistles are fine. Those are easy. It's uh, the bigger books that are more of a challenge to do. But yeah. but again, we need to become familiar with it. And that's the goal of to read and observe. The, the complete goal is just becoming familiar with the book. Mm -hmm. Just just uh, having an understanding. And, and more the more that you read it, the more that, that will help. And I, what I typically do is I will read a book in different translations because there are many English translations. So I'll usually read four or five English translations. Um, and then for you guys, obviously, you could read in in um, Burmese, of course, or uh, uh, Mandarin, or is there a Malay version? Yep. There is, yep. right? Yeah. So you have also those. And what that does, by reading different translations, I'll read one translation many times, but then when I read another one, I will notice things, notice differences sometimes. And again, 
All this is meant to do is to engage my mind as I read, active reading. That's the way I become familiar uh, with it. Because, you know, when we read a book, if we read through a book several times, uh, we can become passive in our reading, right? Uh, Not really concentrate. So we want to encourage active reading. One way to do that is read different translations. Another way to do that is to make observations. So as you go through the book, just write things down that stick out to you. What do you notice? Do you see things repeated? Do you have questions as you're going through? Um, is there some connection that comes to your mind with within the book or perhaps even within another book? Um, it's not interpreting at this stage. You're just beginning to read. It's just it's becoming familiar with and it's active reading. And I think making observations is a very helpful way to encourage active reading. You're looking for things within the book. Uh, again, it can be completely random. It, it's just, what do you notice? What do you see? What sticks out to you? Kind of like a, uh, a detective, when they come upon a crime scene, they're just looking for things. They don't know what's going to be there. They don't know, uh, you know, if a murder weapon is left or some other clue to help them solve the crime. So they're just to, trying to observe. And it's it's a similar for us as we read through a book of scripture, just just notice things, what, what sticks out to you. Now, I didn't do that with Jonah when I was preaching through it, you know, because I thought I'm already familiar with it. But had I taken the time to read through the whole book and make observations, become very familiar, I, I think I would have... Uh, been better prepared to understand the message of the book before I started preaching through it. Any comments about that or questions or thoughts or what do you guys, how do you approach getting familiar with uh, a book that you're going to study? Any other thoughts? I have, yeah, I have a question, Pastor Tim, but uh, before the question, it's just asking for advice. Uh, I, I just want to make two uh, comments, which I've been learning recently and how I wish I had learned it years ago. And uh, just as you said just now, sometimes uh, the deep regrets in my own heart and say, goodness, I have preached that sermon so wrongly. I have missed the main point. I have not hold it within the book context and whatnot. And say, what a shame, you know. And, uh, and <laughs> with the kind of feeling that God, if I, when I go up, you know, and the Moses will say, what have you done with my word? Or Paul say, what have you done with it? You know, you see the fellow and things like that. Anyway, so I've been learning recently, which is, I find it very, uh, what's the word? It opens up my, 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 my mind to understand the scripture. One is to try to see the connections from the book of the Bible to the immediate book to that, to that book. For example, right? We tend to read the book of Judges independent from the book of Ruth. Because to us, there are two different books, all right? But what I learned recently is right at the end of the book of Judges, the very last verse, it says that in those days, there's no king in Israel. Everybody that did what was right in their eyes or fitting in their eyes. And the first verse of the book of Ruth says that uh, in the days when the judges ruled. So the connections between these two books is that really the book of Ruth uh, was highlighting uh, in a very stark manner, the righteous Moabite woman who feared God in the context of the Israelites during the judges' rule where nobody feared God, everybody does what was right in their eyes. So that, that sharp contrast of rules against the time or the, the, the spiritual uh, decay of the time of judges stands out when we are able to read connections between these two books. And at the same comment, which I just learned today, in fact, was the connections from chapter to chapter. And this one was very curious. Just today, in fact, just just now, on the parable of the shrewd manager or the unfaithful steward in Luke chapter 16. All right? And I will read that as independent by itself because we are guided by the artificial uh, chapter divisions. All right? And uh, without connecting it, the uh, parable of the shrewd manager in Luke chapter 16 
to the parable of lost and found in Luke chapter 15. So when Dr. Luke arranged that parable in Luke 16, right after the parable of lost and found, he has an intention, which I didn't see. So these are my comments. And my question is this, which is asking for advice, Pastor Tim. How to read uh, a bigger book of the Bible, such as Genesis, which is really a real challenge, or I'm, in, I'm struggling to read uh, the book of Revelations in one city. Because I, I'm aware that the Pastor John oh. McCarthy is saying that the best is to read the whole book in one city. So I'm struggling. Smaller books, Zechariah, all this, you know, uh, Ephesians, yeah, all this we can handle. Uh, uh, but anything for me, more than 15, 20 chapters, I struggle. So how, how, what is your secret or the tip to do this, Pastor Tim? Yeah. Well, you could buy a, a fan and just turn the fan on. And hold the book I, there, I and the it. pages will go by faster. <laughs> uh, yeah, for the larger books, what I try to do is read a whole book through maybe a few times as a whole, but then normally I'll just break it into like two or three parts, just read. So if it's Genesis, I might read 20 chapters one day, 20 chapters each day, you know, 10 on the mm -hmm. last day. So a few times I'll try to read through the book as a whole in one sitting, but then I'll just break it up into smaller pieces. So yes. yeah, 30 times is, is a lot for those big books. So I, I don't, I'm not able, haven't been able to do that. I, mean, I guess I'm not as committed or dedicated, but usually, I mean, if you can read through a book 10 or 15 times, you're going to be pretty familiar with it. So if you just, for a bigger book, just do 15 or 20 chapters a day. Um, and then maybe a couple days, if you have a you know a little longer time, you can read through the book as a whole. Yeah. So, so, so is it okay to break it down to two or three sittings? Yeah, I mean, it's whatever you can do to get familiar with the book. Uh, there's obviously no rules. There's no, yeah. there's no biblical mandate, you know, when you, uh, to how to study the book it's just that we need to be accurate so this is just help us better understand the book uh, yeah. as a whole or if you want to start you know if you know that in a couple months what you're going to be teaching on if you start a couple months early just do smaller pieces mm -hmm. and and i would encourage too to just sort of you know we we do bible reading just normally as part of a devotion right we read through the bible we should be doing that um uh, all the time but uh you know make it a part of your devotion too as well as you read through a book you know making observations that's what i will do i'll read a few chapters i'll read through a chunk of chapters and then i'll i'll take one i go then at the same time i'm going through the book um so let's say we're we're doing uh, John's gospel, for example. So I might read through, um, you know, 12, 13 chapters. And then I'm, I'll be going through also, I'll start in chapter one and just take a paragraph and then just sort of read through it devotionally and write some observations, some comments and pray in response to that. I'm not interpreting it, but I'm just sort of, and then the next day I'll read through the last half of the book but then I'll go back to chapter one and the next paragraph and I'll just mm. write a few comments. So things that come stick out to me and then mm. uh, use it as sort of a time of devotion as well. And so that's another approach you can, you can take, but there's no rules. This is just a general suggestion recommendation something I found helpful is to read through the book several times so that you're familiar with it. And the, making the observations really helps active, yeah. you know, reading actively. So, you know, having a little notebook and just making notes as things, as you notice them. Yeah. Uh, what, what I did, uh, because in my, my Monday night, the tier class in, uh, from Manila, yeah. currently we're doing, uh, uh, prophetic writing, so we have to read Zechariah and uh, Revelations at least for 10 times, and 
I'm, I'm really struggling with the revelations because to read 21 chapters in one sitting takes me about almost two and a half hours. Uh, I read a bit slower, making notes as I go along. Yeah. So what I've done is I've done that a couple of times, really struggling to force myself to sit, you know, without moving. And then what I found helpful, one particular occasion, at night, in fact, around after the class, is that I uh, I put turn on the uh, audio Bible in the car on Revelation. Then I ah. just drive. I just drive until the whole book finished. And and I didn't realize that it was one hour and a, one and a half hour uh, to finish the whole book of Revelations on the audio Bible. Yeah. Yeah, that's, an, that's another great... Um, thing to do as well and listen to the book uh, also so that that will engage another part of your uh, senses you know the listening so pastor john must have great discipline to able to read through 30 rounds um, yeah he's very committed to to doing doing it that way so i, I don't know if he still does i haven't asked him but um, okay, so read and observe, and and what and one of the things too then is as you do that step, the next step will also help you become familiar with the book, and that is to identify the the background context of the book. And again, we've we've done this before with epistles and with narratives. Um, I'll I'll resend you. I have a a chart with. Let me see, maybe if I can find that real quick. Um, it has the... Give me a moment to pull this up. Let's see. Wow. Oh, there it is. All right. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I'll put this table in in your notes here, but this basically identifies for the background. What are we looking for? We want the setting of the book. So we try to identify the author, the recipients. Um, so the, these are just some, if you can see it here, some guiding questions to consider as you're going through uh, the book. And again, this would be the second step, the background context. So you take note of these different um, categories. So the author, what do we know about him? Do we know who he is or what do we know about him? recipients what do we know about them what are their circumstances uh, do we know anything about their relationship with the author there's a social context that is names mentioned in the book um, and that could also be nations like you're studying Jonah obviously uh, the Assyrians you know the Ninevites would be uh, a group of people mentioned what do we know about them uh, historical so again Canada can we gain an idea of when the book was written and what major um, events have taken place? Do we have an idea of that? Like you mentioned, the great example, Ruth, right? The very first verse tells us when that book takes place in the days of the judges. So that tells us a lot of information. That's really, really helpful because that gives us a background to the book of Ruth. That tells us much about <clears throat> what their situation was. Right. Um, it's the days of the judges. So we know that it's a lot of uh, crime, a 
lot of mm -hmm. terrible events taking place that people were doing whatever they wanted to do. And so that really helps us understand a lot about the background of that story. And mm -hmm. it's actually very important information that we need to know <clears throat> for that. So taking note of, if you can, when the events uh, have taken place. Um, let's see. Um, any places, do you, the geographical context, do we know the places that are mentioned there? So again, like in Ruth, you'll have Moab, you'll have Bethlehem. Uh, so mm -hmm. those would be, what do we know about those locations? Uh, <clears throat> um, cultural context, do we know anything about the culture? So again, in Ruth, there's the practice, the levered marriage, right? Where the, the kinsman redeemer is, is to to uh, pr provide for uh, his brother, his relative's family if, if uh, his relative dies. So knowing that cultural practice is very important in understanding the book of Ruth. And then the theological uh, context of the book. Um, you know, what are the, what, like for, again, if you're studying Jonah, what do we know about the theology of Jonah, of the Ninevites? Those would be helpful features to understand. And then finally, what prompted the book to be written, the occasion of the book? Can we figure out what it was that caused the author to write uh, the book? So, so these are all different categories as you study the background of the book. All right. And we don't have to answer every single question, but they're just intended to guide and direct our study. So after you've read through the book several times, then made observations, then you go back and the second step is go through the book again and take note of these features. I actually start doing it when I'm excuse me, reading through the book. I'll start taking notes as well of uh, when I make observations, I'll try to identify places that mentioned, people mentioned, what mm -hmm. things are the author. So those are some things I start looking for as I'm just reading through the book. But when I do the background context, then I'll actually, you know, note under each category, the author, the historical, the social. So again, I'll, I'll put that uh, table in the notes that I send you guys so you can have that as a reference. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the background context that we want to understand from the book. And then finally... <clears throat> The third category <clears throat> that we've done before is the literary context, or it's also referred to as the contextual flow of the book. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's it's just what uh, Yu Chai was mentioning and with uh, when he was talking about Luke, is that every chapter, every part of the book is is a in uh, part of the author's flow of thought. And so, for example, Luke 16 has a connection to Luke 15, which is connected to Luke 14 and 13 and 12. And they all form this sort of flow together. Or we can even talk about Jonah as an example. Mm -hmm. Jonah 1. What's the What happens in the first chapter of Jonah? Anybody? He ran in the exact opposite of what God seemed to do. Yeah, God tells him to go to the Ninevites because their wickedness it was great. And so he said he wanted them to go and declare judgment. And Jonah, of course, goes the other direction, gets on the boat, has the whole thing with the sailors, the storm he's thrown over. Mm. Then we have chapter two, which is what happens in chapter two, Jonah. He was in the belly of a big fish and then prayed to God. Exactly. It's in the belly of the fish and actually gives a, a psalm of thanksgiving when God delivered him. Uh, yep. Used the fish to save him from dying and delivered mm -hmm. him. The fish spits him out. Then we have chapter three where then he... God tells him again, go to Nineveh. This time, Jonah agrees. 
And we think, oh, okay, great, right? Jonah's doing what he was told. And so he goes to Nineveh, but then, and he preaches the, you know, 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. The Ninevites repent. And we think, oh, that's great, a great story. But it doesn't end at chapter three, does it? There's a fourth chapter. And in the fourth chapter, we learn why Jonah didn't want to go. And so the whole thing revealed Jonah was still, he was angry at God for showing mercy. Mm. Uh, he wanted to die, right? So he goes out, there's the whole thing with the plant, and God uses that to get Jonah's attention. But we, we begin to see that each of these chapters are connected. They're not isolated. They're linked together under this umbrella of the theme of God's compassion. That he showed compassion on the sailors in the first chapter and delivered them from the storm. And even, I believe, delivered them, their souls, from eternal ruin. Chapter 2, God is, you know, had delivered Jonah, showed compassion on him. Chapter 3, he shows compassion on the Ninevites. And then chapter four, he shows again compassion on Jonah by, uh, you know, confronting his sin. And so, but each of those chapters, we can see linked together and there's a flow of thought to them. And it's the same in every book. In epistles, each chap, each uh, paragraph is linked together. In narratives, each story is linked together. And then within each story, there are scenes that that connect the story. And then in, in poems, it's the stanzas that are linked together. Um, and so every book, as the author, what he writes and the order that he writes is connected together as a flow of thought. We, we've talked about this uh, several times, but it's very important that we always recognize this, that every part of a book is connected in some way to the flow of thought in the book. And uh, one way with epistles, what we do is we identify each paragraph in the epistle and then summarize each paragraph. What's the point of that paragraph? What's the idea? So, for example, in Ephesians, the first paragraph is praise to God for his work in our salvation. That's in verses 3 to 14 of chapter 1. Then Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, I think, the, the rest of chapter 1 is Paul's prayer that they would understand what God has done in their salvation. And then chapter 2, he begins with, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God made you alive. And so Paul, again, goes back to uh, further discussing what God has done in our salvation, that he took a, us who were dead and made us alive. And then... The next paragraph in chapter 2, he speaks to the Gentiles, that they were even further away from God than the Jews, and how God brought them together, reconciliation brought them peace. Mm -hmm. So it's all connected together, is the point. So you summarize each paragraph. Now, in a narrative, it's a little different. You have stories. So we want to understand Generally, what is the point of each story and how do those connect together? Like you, Chai, was mentioning in Luke 15, Luke 16. In the original writing, there's no chapters, there's no verses, there's just stories. And each story is linked together somehow. And so we want to try to understand, like in Jonah, Jonah 1 is the first story, Jonah 2 is a, um, a second uh Part of the book Jonah 3 is another story than Jonah 4 and those are four different um, acts if you will four different scenes that are all connected together in some way they're not random um, but they're intended by the author to communicate the overall message of his book and so we want to understand each each story in the book, at least an overall idea. We won't know the details till we study more carefully, but at least to understand the general flow of thought. So that's called the contextual flow. We do that for every book of the Bible, except one, which I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, any comments or questions about that 
so far? Uh, Pastor Tim, uh, I, I just noticed as you were talking this now, just flip through the book of Jonah, and I just noticed that uh, uh, it is written or Jonah is referred to in the third person, not the first person. Say, for example, in Jonah 2, uh, the prayer of Jonah, instead of saying from inside the fish, I pray to the Lord God and I say, but it's Jonah pray and he said. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, Jonah may not be the author of the book of Jonah. It could be written by a third person. So my question is, if a third person pronoun is used to refer to the prophet in this case, uh, what are the uh, cautions or the special attention we must pay to as we read through the book? If it is a third, is a later author or a third person pronoun is used. Well, that's a whole, whole other discussion that, that we'll talk about when we get to prophecy, prophetic books. Uh, just because the third person is used does not mean that he didn't write it. Uh, Moses okay. referred to himself in the third person all through the Pentateuch, and we know he was the author. Zechariah, uh, there are parts in Zechariah where he speaks in the first person and then also in the third person. Um, mm -hmm. So um, normally the biblical writers often, uh, if, the, if they wrote the, the book, if it was about themselves, they would often use uh, either the first or the third person. Okay. So I, I did kind of a whole study of all the prophetic books. And basically, my conclusion was, I believe that all the prophetic books are indeed written by the prophet, um, okay. or at least contain his message. Like Obadiah and Joel, the whole book mm -hmm. is just their message. Um so Jonah, yes, it's possible someone else wrote it, uh, but it's likely that he did, just based on the pattern. But don't know for sure, um, can't say for sure, and I wouldn't build a whole point on that. You know, I wouldn't say, look, Jonah definitely repented because he wrote this book. Well, we don't know for sure uh, mm -hmm. if he wrote it. So um, that'd be the first thing to consider. Just because it's the third person does not mean that Jonah did not write it. And I, again, I think I've got several examples. Like I said, Moses or Zechariah or Amos, same thing in Amos. He'll refer to himself in the first person in some chapters and in the third person in other chapters. Mm, so mm. Uh, this was a common practice uh, of the biblical writers. But if it is in the third person, for example, mm -hmm. if someone else wrote, like in uh, the book of Ruth, it was probably not written by anyone, any of the characters in that book. Um, mm -hmm. It was written later in the time of David because it mentions David being born, right? So, uh, so it was like it was written by someone else. So that was a book in the third person. But so, what was your question? And knowing that it was written in the third person. What was your what, what are the what are the uh, uh, caution or the special attention we must pay to when it is written by the third person? Um, not sure how. Do you have a specific concern or something that you were thinking about uh, that, that I, I was the question about? Yeah, I was thinking like if it's written if the book is written by the third person because it is written uh, much later usually. All right. And maybe even uh, a, a certain period of time has passed between the actual event and when the book was written. And do we have to pay special attention such as the uh, narrator's comment on actually what happened there, it was this and that. Or uh, the, the, the author, uh, the later author, the third person author, would have that passage of time to reflect on the event and he probably write it in a certain perspective that as compared to the first person. Do you have to pay attention to things like that? Yeah, I think, and that's where you're really, when you're doing the background of the book, you're going to want to notice that. Because, again, taking Ruth, for example. Ruth is written not in the days of the story, but written after the yeah, fact, right? Written cool. in the time of David. Yeah. So, so the author had a particular reason for mm. writing that story in that time. 
and this this again reinforces that that the historical narrative is not just history there's a theological purpose to the story think of the gospel of john well all the gospels right they're all written later you know after the events of in the gospels but you have the first three gospels written in the late 50s maybe mid oh. to late 50s ad um matthew then mark then luke and then john comes along you know 30 yeah. years later yeah. to write a gospel where he writes of similar events but a lot of different events that we don't find in the first three gospels but we realize yeah. john wrote the gospel because of particular heresies that had risen up attacking the person of Christ. And so John wrote his gospel, not just to give more stories about Jesus, but mm. to address those theological problems, uh, theological heresies that had become more of an issue in the church. Mm. And so knowing that, you know, that understanding that, okay, John wrote this later because that that will help us to understand, you know, why he did that. Or mm -hmm. even the book of Ruth, written in the days of David, I think, was a reflection. Because the book begins, the last uh, words of Judges, as you said, there's no king. No king, that's right. But what's the end of Ruth? David. There is, yeah, there's a kingly line that is coming out. Yeah, David's mentioned specifically. And so I think the book of Ruth actually is intended by the author to be a story that shows God's care and concern, not just for this widow, but mm. that really was a picture of his care and concern for Israel. That mm. he had taken Israel from the days when there was no king, when there was chaos and crime and rape and just mm. terrible things. And he mm. had given them the good King David. Mm. And so uh, I think that's the primary message of Ruth. And then, of course, as believers, we can see the book of Ruth even in a bigger light, how God uh, showed kindness to humanity by sending a descendant of David to, to bring salvation to us. So we can even see a bigger picture mm -hmm. and how that book of Ruth can fit in the Bible as a whole. But knowing the background of Ruth and understanding uh, you know, the author wrote it at a later time. He wrote it in the days of David, I think, as a testimony to God's kindness right. and mercy uh, that he wanted to express this story to show God's mercy towards his people. And so the the mercy shown to Naomi and Ruth was just a picture of the mercy shown to, to the, the whole nation through bringing David, because otherwise that genealogy makes no sense in the story. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. fit. It's kind of boring. It's a terrible way to end the story. If you're just looking for, you know, the this is a great love story, you know, and, and then all of a sudden you have this genealogy at the end. It's like, that's kind of weird. But when you understand that the point of the story was meant to point to what God had done for Israel. Uh, through the story of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, I think that reveals what the author's doing. So yes, understanding, um, in that case, again, we don't know who the specific author is, but we do know hmm. that he came, he was writing in a later time than the yep. book itself. And that knowing the background helps to helps us to understand what he's doing. Yeah, thank you. In fact, Pastor Tim, thank you so much for uh, sharing about the book of Ruth because by being able to see the linkage uh, from the end of Judges and there's no king to the end of Ruth, down there is David mentioned, that you have just said that it is to portray the faithfulness of God and, uh, and the love of God for Israel in bringing through them a king eventually through David and then of course in the New Testament we see that is in fact the Davidic line that was established eventually come to our Lord Jesus by knowing this 
we will not tend to interpret the book of Ruth as either a romantic story between Ruth and Boaz, all right, or the faithfulness of a Boamite woman, Ruth, no doubt it is there, of uh, being filial uh, to the mother-in-law, Naomi, and her own sense of uh, 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 righteousness in God, in a sense. So we will miss the the, the author intend that it is, yes, it is about the romantic story. Yes, it is about how carrying Boaz to uh, to to uh, uh, to leave the gleanings for the poor to pick it up, or even his care for Ruth in chapter two to tell to tell the man not to touch her. Yes, it's all there, but we miss the to me the main truth of God God being faithful and God's providence uh, in bringing up a king. All right. So, so what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, that we, we will tend to read and interpret the book in one direction, which is probably not sharp enough in the exegesis, unless we start seeing what you just mentioned just now about hey, what why why is that the genealogy towards the end of the book of Ruth? All right. That the author could have finished that you know Boaz took Ruth and they have they consider son. And then Naomi is so happy, praise the Lord, and somewhere in verse 13 or 14 of Ruth chapter 4, and then added a line called, they live happily ever after. <laughs> but he didn't stop there. So I learned from you uh, in our previous last year by asking the question when we look at John chapter 4, why was the dialogue between Jesus and the disciples when the disciples came back from the village to look for bread, why was it there in the first place? He could have taken it out and the story would still flow. Yeah. Right. Likewise, yeah. in this case, yeah, exactly. Because so, I mean, if if uh, if it ended in verse fifteen, right, where yeah. <laughs> where Naomi, <laughs> right, uh, women said to Naomi, because right, the baby's sitting on Naomi's lap. Yes. Um, she gave birth, and the women said. You look at Naomi, oh yeah, Naomi took yeah. the child, put him on her bosom, became his nurse. The neighbor woman, the son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. So if it had yeah. ended here, yep, and they like, leave oh wow, what Naomi. a wonderful story, right? Naomi yeah. who left and came back bitter, and and now God had shown her kindness, and so, mm. but then yeah, you have these final verses here, which you have to go. What is that <laughs> doing there? Yeah. You realize, ah, this story isn't just about Naomi. Mm. The broader story. By the way, Naomi's the main character in the story, not Mo, not Boaz okay. or Ruth. Um, because it's the story centers around Naomi. Because look, notice how it ends, right? It ends with the baby on Naomi's lap, not Ruth and Boaz. But anyway, um, but yeah, then you have this genealogy, which is very, you know, different kind of boring right compared to this wonderful love story and so mm -hmm. that should stick out to us so, ah okay the author has something else going on here that he wants yeah. us to to understand and uh it's not just about naomi and ruth and boaz it's really about god mm -hmm. because again remember right the bible is god's book so if you take the story of Ruth and make it all about Ruth and Naomi and Boaz and focus on them as character and, you know, and they do have, there's wonderful things we can learn from their example, both good and bad, by the way, but they aren't the main focus of the book. God's the main focus and what he did and how he orchestrated events in order mm. to not only bring about the, the care for Naomi and Ruth, but also the care for Israel. And so it, it highlights God's mercy, really his providence, his providence to bring about, mm -hmm. um, to demonstrate his kindness towards his people. And so that's why we see hints of that all the way through the book. How God caused this, he caused that, he did this, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Naomi or Ruth, so it just says, just, so happened on the field of Boaz, and there's emphasis by the author there that like she just happened to pick that field, you know, and just identifying God's providence in leading and guiding her. So it wasn't, 
you know, Boaz was a godly man and he's one we should learn things from, but that's not the main point of the story. Mm. You know, Ruth, Ruth's conversion, her loyalty, uh, wonderful characteristics, wonderful qualities that we should follow and as, as an example, but she's not the main point of the story. Mm. So we just have to be careful as we go through to identify what's the author want us to see here. Is it character studies? Or is it a love story? And like, this is the perfect way to approach, you know, so if you teach Ruth as, you know, eight principles for pursuing marriage from the book of Ruth, <laughs> I think you've missed the point. Um, now, if I'm teaching on marriage from Ephesians and I want to use Boaz as an example, an illustration, well, that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. when husbands, mm -hmm. you know, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So if I want to talk about sacrificial love, you know, I could use illustrations like Boaz, but but the book of Ruth was not written as a story to show us how to find a wife or how to really find a husband, right? Because it was the women who were... <laughs> um, uh, I, I was laughing, Pastor T. We, someone could have said eight principles or strategies how to find a righteous husband from the book yeah. of Ruth. <laughs> or how yeah, to that, tackle them. Yeah, That would miss, the, miss the point. <laughs> So, so we just want to make sure we understand. Now, as you preach through the book, certainly you can highlight these things mm. uh, as examples, but we want to make sure we keep the main the focus of the author in view um, as we tell the story. So this, again, has to do with understanding the purpose of the book and how each part of the book fits under that purpose, the author's flow of thought. And what he's doing there. And yeah, I think you made a good point earlier, you Chai. That we got to be careful. Don't don't let the chapters numbers. Um, those are added much later. Those are just guides to go for the book. But don't let those chapter numbers force um, mm. force you to separate. Yeah. In your mind, these stories, they're all connected together. Um the chapters just help us keep track of, you know, where we are in the book. But uh, they're not inspired, you know, division. Mm. And we even see that in Jonah, for example. The, the chapter, notice in Jonah, Jonah 1, right, ends with Yahweh appointed a fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days. That really goes with chapter 2. Mm, mm. right because then it says then jonah prayed from the stomach of the fish so and in fact by the way the hebrew bible actually does split the chapter oh. here can you see that comment yes, chapter yes. two verse one in, is in in the hebrew text is in chapter oh 117 wow. is actually chapter two verse one in the hebrew bible wow. so if i were to here's the the Hebrew text, notice it ends at verse 16 mm. because verse 17 is actually verse 1 of chapter 2. All right, that's oh. where it says, here's the word fish, right? Uh, appointed, and, and appointed Yahweh a fish, a great fish, right? And it swallowed Jonah. Okay, so be careful with Generally, the chapters are helpful, but so like when you get to chapter three, yes, there's a there is a break there. But I would say verse 10 almost should go with chapter three, verse one. But because it's part of that next, then Yahweh spoke to the fish, it vomited up Jonah. And now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Mm -hmm. So just be careful with the chapter divisions. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other comments or questions on the flow of thought of the book, the purpose of the book, how it connects? Sorry, Pastor Tim, it's just a bit of a fun comment that uh, the, the Bible chapters division we have, we have been using is, uh, I think, uh, done by this British guy called Stephen Langdon in the 1500 something. So apparently, from the, the record is that some of the division 
chapter division, he was doing it when he was on horseback. Oh. So the yeah, story I... is that sometimes he, he, the, the pencil was jerking when the horseback is, oops, it should be, you know, just like the end of uh, chapter one of Jonah should be part of chapter two, but the horseback was really the problem when he was riding on the horseback doing the chapter divisions. Could have been. It, it was more of a fun story. I'm not sure how true is that, but I have yeah. it been, been mentioned before. Yeah, I think it was back 13th century or some 12th century when the chapter divisions came in. But yeah, I don't know the whole history of that. Might that's some in, that would be something interesting to to uh, read about. But they're helpful, obviously, because it's easier to you know for us to reference and mm -hmm. things like that. So I appreciate that they're there because it's it'd be a lot harder say you know. Yeah. But you can see even in uh, Hebrews, right that. They didn't really have the divisions at that point because he said, you know, he would say like, like where it says, uh, as it is written, you know, they, or even in Luke, right? It just says Jesus unrolled the scroll to where Isaiah said, mm -hmm. you no. Know, but now we would just say, you know, Isaiah sixty-one. Um, now there's a few other elements here that I think is important to understand when we talk about contextual flow, that there's really, I think, uh, when we consider poetry, the poetic genre, there's three kinds of books we should be aware of as we're considering the contextual flow. Um, there are three mm. kinds of books that contain poetry. Uh, there are those books that are primarily narrative. They have poetic sections in them. So, for example, we just saw one in Jonah, didn't we? Right, Jonah chapter one is narrative. And then when we get to chapter two, it's a poem. As he's in the belly of the fish, he cries out. And this is really a psalm. It has a structure of a psalm. It's a poem of Jonah expressing gratitude for deliverance. And then he ends it with salvation belongs to Yahweh. All right. Um Another example of that, if you look at 1 Samuel 2, we have a narrative, right, of Hannah, right? And she's uh, without child, and she's feeling that burden. She's being taunted by the other wife of Elkanah, and then um, she goes to the temple and prays, right? And then we have this uh, hymn of praise from Hannah in chapter two, first 10 verses. Mm -hmm. By the way, a prayer that later, verse eight, is referred to in Psalm 8, uh, Psalm, sorry, uh, one, 113. So the psalmist was paying attention to Hannah's prayer because he essentially says the same thing that she does. But in any case, we have right in the middle of first Samuel, this narrative, right at the beginning of first Samuel, in this narrative, a poem. Uh, there's another example in Exodus, Exodus 15, Song mm. of Moses. All right. This, I think, is the first song uh, written in the Bible. It's not the first poem, by the way. Do you know where the first poem in the Bible is? Genesis? Yeah. Genesis what? what was it the guy that says he will kill people? Who... What is it now? No. No. Even before that. Oh. Anybody have an idea? Or was it Adam in verse 23 of Genesis 2? Yeah. Genesis chapter 2. Right? And notice even the translation here changed the format to indicate it's a poem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Notice this one. See, the rep this one finally is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman because this one was taken out of man. So there's a poetic elements here that are being expressed. So, yeah, the first poem actually, again, is in a narrative. It's in the sixth day of creation. So the first day that man is on the earth. Um, and by the way, these are the first words out of a human being's mouth. Recorded in the Bible. It's a love poem. So 
So something to keep in mind, guys. <laughs> so um, and then Exodus 15, right in the middle of the Exodus narrative, we have this song of Moses. So there are many examples of uh, poems or poetic expressions contained in the middle of, of narratives. And so we have to, we recognize that to be the case. So studying these poems, you just, you're going to study in the same way. There'll be a flow of thought. You'll have stories in flow. And then you've got this, this poem embedded within, in the story. It's still part of the flow of thought, right? It's like Jonah 2. Even though it's a poem, it's still connected to the narrative, right? It's Jonah's prayer or praise in the belly of the fish. So it's still connected to the, the narrative itself, but as part of the narrative, the uh, author included Jonah's prayer, which was in the far form of poetry or in the narrative of Pentateuch in Exodus, Mm -hmm. Song of Moses is connected to the events around it. Um, and so when we go to study the flow of thought, that poem, we'll, we will interpret the poem a little differently because it's poetic language. So we need to understand parallelism, figurative language, poetic devices. But still, we're going to understand the purpose or point of that poem within the flow of the narrative connected all right questions about that that makes sense this is important to understand when you get to prophetic books because prophetic books have a whole mixture of genres they're a lot more complicated so you'll have a like in jeremiah you'll have a narrative narrative and then all of a sudden there'll be this um prophetic utterance this which will be written in the form of poetry. Uh, it had a poetic, it'll have poetic expressions, imagery, uh, parallelism, things like that. So you have to understand, though, that that sermon, which is expressed in a poetic way, is still part of the flow of thought in the book of Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. So that sermon's connected to the narrative portion that is around it. Mm. Okay. Now there's a a second type of book when we're that contains poetry, and that is those books that are essentially entirely poetic. Uh, as I've mentioned, there are several wisdom books like that: Ecclesiastes, Job, Song of Solomon, where the whole book is poetic, but it's a wisdom book. Um, and then you have prophetic books. Like I mentioned, so for example, if we were to look at, say, the book of Obadiah, Obadiah is a prophetic book. It's in the prophetic genre. Okay, it's the vision of Obadiah. It was concerning Edom. And then notice, and you can even see the format of the book. It's poetic. And we can find uh, expressions, parallelism, figurative language, right? Uh you build loftily like the eagle. What's that? Like the eagle is what kind of poetic device? Does anyone remember? Oh. Uh, zoom off. I'm really? uh, sorry. Zhang Chen, what'd you say? I said see, see me, see me, oh. Simile, yes. Like oh, yeah. the eagle. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Though you set your nest among the stars. Again, they don't literally, they aren't, uh, these Edomites don't build nests. They're humans. So this mm -hmm. nest is actually metonymy for a house, mm -hmm. right? They're dwelling, right? You who dwell in the clefts of the cliff. So though you set your nest, so he's still making the comparison to the eagle. And they have a nest. And he says, you set it among the stars. Well, that's figurative. They don't literally have, they're not literally building nests in the stars, but it's an image. So, so he, Obadiah all the way through uses poetic language, but this is a sermon, a prophetic sermon. 
that is written with poetic language. All right, the same thing in Joel. The word of Yahweh came to Joel, and then he speaks in poetic language all the way through. Imagery, um, comparisons, repetition. All right, and so... Right, the terseness, right? The field is destroyed, the land mourns, the grain is destroyed, the new wine dries up, fresh oil fails, right? So this is all this is poetic. Uh he's expressing this poetically. Be ashamed, O farmers. There's apostrophe, right? Direct address. Wail, O vine dressers. So um, so there are several books that are uh, poetic all the way through the books. Song of Solomon, of course, is a uh, well-known, right? This is love poems between a husband and wife. And as you go through it, it's all, right? Like the tents of Kedar, simile. Like the curtains of Solomon, simile. So you're going to see it's all written in poetic language. And so we have uh, several books in the Bible that are entirely poetic. Many examples. Now, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, those are mixed. They're mostly poetic, but there's also narrative features uh, within the books as well. And then there's a third kind of book that is uses poetry, and it's a special class. It's the Book of Psalms. All right? The Book of Psalms, which is also entirely poetic. But what is unique What's unique about the book of Psalms compared to all the other books of the Bible? When you think about the book of Psalms, the way it's structured, um, how is it, what is unique about that book compared to every other biblical book? Any ideas? Are you, are you asking the way the book, the Psalm, the book of Psalms is structured? Or the, the 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 sums themselves. Well, just just what about the book? Shilong, you were for, gonna. Your go is for singing. Okay. It's for music. Yeah, it's a uh, a hymn book. Actually, the the word psalm comes from the Greek word psalmus, right, which means song, mm -hmm. song of praise from a stringed instrument. So yeah, m many and most of the psalms are intended to be sung. So that's that's unique as a book. Anything else that's unique about the book of Psalms? Uh, I was thinking that uh, it is divided into five books. And the five books division has got a certain correspondence or corresponding, wow, well, correspondent uh, uh, idea to the Torah itself. Okay, yeah, we'll talk about that that structure, but it is it's been compiled into five what are called books. Mm. It contains too many, too too much as as precious. Sorry, too much what? As as precious. Human as precious. Okay. Yep. Compared to the other other uh poetic uh, form like Job because it's a lot of debate but uh, for, for for some it's not uh, it's actually a, a lot of monologue yes yeah they're all they're all independent poems mm -hmm. right they're all self-contained um, independent poems that have been collected together over time but but they're not part of, um, you know, each book of the Bible written by a particular author with a particular purpose and a flow of thought, right? Every book of the Bible is structured that way except Psalms. Psalms has multiple authors with independent poems written. Each poem has its own background. 
each poem has its own purpose. Mm. So it's not like one book where all the poems together form this plot or this overarching purpose or flow of thought. They're actually all independent. Now, they've been collected together in sections. Like you Chai mentioned, there are books, like five books that contain groupings of the Psalms. There are particular Psalms like the Songs of Ascent, which are intended to be a collection together to be sung at a particular time of year. But even still, every Psalm, except for a couple, and we'll talk about those later, Every psalm is its own unique independent poem focusing on one particular topic mm. with its own background and its own purpose. And again, there's multiple authors and we'll get into the psalms in a, in a minute, but it's important, I think, to understand the book of Psalms is, is an anthology. That is a collection of independent poems. Um uh, there's no other book like it. One that's similar is Proverbs. But even Proverbs has one primary author. There may be a couple others at the end. But Solomon is the primary author, and he has a purpose in the book of Proverbs. He states it in chapter 1. So that book is written, and then chapters 1 to 9 are a group of uh, extended poems that are all linked together. And then chapter 10, you have these independent um, pro uh, proverbial sayings from chapters 10 to 30. And then chapter 31 is a, is a final single poem focused on the godly wife. But, mm. but really, Proverbs, though, still has an overarching purpose and theme as stated by a particular author. So it, it's, it's more similar to... A, the other books of the Bible in that sense, but the Psalms is complete. They're all completely independent poems that each has their own theme and purpose and background. All right. So keep that in mind. So when you study the Psalms, you don't need to read all the Psalms to understand a particular Psalm. Now, when you study the book of John, for example, you do need to read and know the whole book of John to understand each part of John because mm. it's a book with a singular author, a particular purpose, a flow of thought. But the Psalms are not like that. The Psalms have several authors over a period of time, and each poem expresses a particular theme and background. So they're not all the poems are not linked together to form a flow of thought. Now, someone has come later and collected the Psalms and ordered them in such a way that there are mm. some connections thematically, but that's not from the original author. Mm, mm. And we'll talk about that um, uh, next, next time we gather. We'll focus our attention on the Psalms in particular. So this is important to understand. This is why the Psalms are great, because you don't have to study the whole book. <laughs> you can just you can skip the first three steps, really, with the book of Psalms. You don't have to read the whole book and make observations and then do the flow of thought in the background because each psalm, they're not connected in the same way as mm -hmm. every other book of the Bible. So all you need to focus on is just the particular psalm, right? So yeah. praise God. You don't have to, to read through the whole book 30 you times. <laughs> so if you're going to study Psalm, you know, Psalm 21, you don't have to read Psalm 1 to 150 a bunch of times. You can just focus on Psalm 21. Now, there may be connections with that psalm and another psalm mm. that you observe, but, but the focus is going to be Psalm 21 has its own theme, its own author's intended purpose, and its own setting, its own uh, background. So you just need to focus on that psalm. You don't have to study a bunch of other psalms at the same time. Okay, so that's why the book of Psalms, and if you'll notice in the the notes here, um, when we started, I had read and observe the book except for Psalms. Background context of the book 
except you don't do this for the Psalms. You don't look at the background of the whole book of Psalms because it's not one book with a flow of thought and an overall purpose intended by one author. It's a series of a collection of independent poems. So we don't mm -hmm. have to do the first three steps if you're studying a psalm from the book of Psalms. Okay, now there are psalms found outside of the book of Psalms. I already mentioned to you like Jonah 2 is one. Uh, Habakkuk 3 is another. A prayer of Habakkuk according to the Shigian Oath. And this is, notice it has Salah in it. This is a psalm. It's a psalm written by Habakkuk as part of his book. So it fits in the flow of the book of Habakkuk, though. Even though it's a it's a psalm, it's not independent in this case from the book. Okay. But the Psalms, all of them are, as I said, an anthology, a collection of independent poems that are to be interpreted separately. You don't have to do the first three steps for that case. All right. That's the only book in the Bible like that. All the other ones you need to do the read through the book, make observations, and then the background setting of the book, and then the flow of thought of the book. Okay. Even for Proverbs, because Proverbs does have a primary author and and a uh, flow of thought mm -hmm. to it. Questions or comments on that? We'll talk about the ordering of the Psalms and all that a little bit later. So we'll come back to this um, topic. But at least wanted us to understand the unique the uniqueness of the Book of Psalms as a book. Comments or questions? All right, well, let's take up just a few minutes that we have remaining tonight and start. Uh, I want us to, to focus some attention on the book of Psalms, since that is the most well-known poetic book in the Bible. It's the biggest book in the Bible in terms of length. Um, and understanding that Psalms, I think, if I remember correctly, are the most quoted book in the New Testament. There's more quotes from the Psalms than any other book. I think Jesus quoted the Psalms more than any other book, if I remember correctly. Uh, at least he quoted them quite often. But I believe that uh, most of the, there are more quotations or references to the Psalms than any other book in the New Testament. And, as I said, you know, knowing how poetry works will help you interpreting poetic features in other books. So I wanted to have us take a, a little time and just focus on the, the Psalms themselves and try to understand Book of Psalms better uh, and, and, under, and approaching it. And, and plus, too, it's often helpful in the church to preach through series of psalms, right? I know like our church in the summertime, we go through psalms. We'll do, you know, eight or ten messages on the psalms as a special. So each summer we focused attention on that. We're just going through the psalms. But there are times, uh, you know, where it's helpful uh, to, to preach through a, a psalm or some psalms, a uh, particular topic or issue. You know, some wonderful psalms on the character of God, Psalm 139, Psalm 145. Uh, so the most enriching doctrines or teachings on the character attributes of God are really in any book. Um, so there are many psalms that, that unfold or reveal the character of God in incredible ways. Um, so psalms are really good book to understand and preach from. So I wanted to start with just a little, uh, you know, kind of quiz for you. Um, we know the Psalms are a collection of 150 poems. There are a couple of places where it's possible that two Psalms may have been connected together. Um, I'll, we'll take a look at those as we go through it later. But as I mentioned already, the word psalm comes from the Greek word psalmos, which 
is a strong song of praise from a stringed instrument or from the plucking of the strings. And it's referred to in two passages in the New Testament. The Hebrew mm. word for psalm, or the, in the Hebrew Bible, the title for psalm is mitzmor, which is a song accompanied by musical instruments. So it's pretty much the same, <laughs> the same word. So just like uh, Shulong mentioned, right, the psalms are, for the most part, intended to be sung. Uh, there are songs that are not only of praise, but also other kinds that we'll, we'll see as we go through this introduction together. Now, I wanted to sort of do a, a little quiz with you for that. The uh, Hebrew title for the collection of the Psalms is the Tehillim, which means praises or songs of praise. And while many of the Psalms are songs of praise, not all of them are. There are many laments within the Psalms as well. So as, as I just mentioned, but let's start with a few maybe fun questions here. And uh, I'm just going to go around kind of as a pop quiz. Fu Wei, you're going to get the easiest question of the night. How many Psalms are there, Fu Wei? 150. Yes, there's 150. <laughs> now, what's interesting that the Old Testament translation the Septuagint actually has 151. It added one. All right. But that's not inspired. Septuagint also contains the Apocrypha, some of the Apocryphal books. So the Septuagint's not an inspired translation. It's just a translation and actually added in a few other books. But uh, just keep that in mind. Okay. Jun Sheng? You get the next question. What is the shortest psalm in the psalms? Psalm um, 117. Yes. That was easy. 117. Do you remember how many verses? Two. Two, yeah. It's the preacher's favorite book in the Bible, favorite chapter in the Bible. Right? Two verses. Now, uh, Fu Wei, or sorry, uh, Jun Sheng, what's the longest psalm? 119. Yeah, do you remember how many verses are in that one? 164. Is it? Close. 168. Remember, one. You're, you're, you're close. There's a few more. A few more. Yeah, there's 22. One. Remember, there's 22 stanzas because they remember the, the structure is an acrostic. So each, every eight yeah. verses begins with the same letter. 176. Yeah. So there's 176 verses in this psalm. Okay, let me get a little bit more challenging here. Um, Pastor Philip, what is the oldest psalm that we know of? Is it 110? Okay. No, that one's written by David. Oh. So it's not 110. Mm. Yeah, I told you this one's a little more challenging. Yeah. There's so it might be a Moses psalm. Yes. Which uh, one is guys, that? But uh, I don't know the number, but I nine yeah. zero. Yes. 19. Oh, nine zero. Oh, right. <clears throat> Thank Great. you. Right. Uh -huh. but you you were, you got it. Uh, the prayer of Moses, the man of God. So mm. we actually have a psalm written by Moses. Mm. Right now, there was the song of Moses, but that's in Exodus 15. But the oldest psalm that is in the Psalter, in the book of Psalms, is Psalm 90. Of course, he mentions here, right, to teach us to number our days. Um, so that we may present to you a heart of wisdom, right? Teach us. So it's a you know a wonderful psalm, focusing attention on the brevity of life and the importance of of uh, keeping our priorities. But Psalm ninety, written by Moses. When did he write this? Do you remember around when did Moses live? Do 
You remember, Pastor Philip, about when Pope Moses right. uh, lived? When did he write this? Maybe how about 14th century BC? Yes. Um, he wrote this. If we remember the timeline that we've talked about before, the five names and the number 500. You can remember these oh. five names, right? Yeah. In the 500 years. So mm -hmm. Moses was around 1500 BC. Technically, it was around 1440 BC, but close mm. to 1500. So if the first psalm was written around this time, we also have then, let me uh, let me ask Xu Long this one. What's the most recent psalm? What's the last psalm written? Shulong, do you have any idea? What's the most recent psalm, Shulong? Is it 190? Uh, sorry, 39. Okay, Psalm 139. Let's take a look. <coughs> Okay, this psalm is written by David, so it's not the last one. There were a couple of psalms that were written during or after the exile in Babylon. Oh, is that the one that's saved by the river of Babylon? Yeah, I think, is that 126? 126 talks about the the ones that were captive ones that returned. This is during the exile, restore our captivity as the streams of the Negev. Mm -hmm. And then Psalm 137, I think it is, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. Yeah, that is a funny one because right, I think the, the singing group, Bonnie M, has put a totally wrong tune to this song. Uh, wouldn't mm -hmm. surprise me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so this one uh <clears throat> written in the exile so those would be if we go back to our table here the exile was around the time of daniel the return okay. will be 486 something like that. yeah so yeah. you have um so psalm Psalm 90, written in the time of Moses, and then you have Psalm 126 and 137, written around mm. the exile. So notice, we have almost a thousand years mm -hmm. separating the first and last psalm. Now, many of the psalms, of course, are written by David. Mm. So a bulk of the Psalms are written around the time of David, but there are a few that extend all the way back to Moses and all the way forward to the time of the exile. Okay. Let me ask uh, Daniel this question. Which Psalm is the most quoted? In the New Testament, Brother Daniel. Hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, this is a little tough, but you need to take a guess. Uh, let me see. Most quoted. Hmm. By that, I mean, yeah, just separate references. Wow, you caught me there. Mm -hmm. By the way, as you're thinking, and then others can <clears throat> can give input, but um, I did find that 93 of the 150 Psalms are quoted in the New Testament. Oh. 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 So it's... And... And 23 of the 27 New Testament books quote at least one psalm. 
So the, the New Testament borrows heavily, refers heavily back to the Psalms. Uh, it's the most quoted book also in the uh, Psalms, most quoted book in the New Testament. Would it be 22? Okay, 22 is a great, a great guess. Psalm 22, <laughs> I think, is mentioned uh, seven times. Yeah. Quoted yes, seven times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Psalm 110. Psalm what? 110. Okay, another excellent, excellent guess. Uh, I have that as eight times. 118. Wow. There's the winner. Nine times. <laughs> Psalm 108 is 12 <laughs> times. Ah, uh, well, I guess I got it. <laughs> and then Psalm 69 is also quoted a few, four times. That's another. But yeah, Psalm 118, Messianic. By the way, the two most quoted ones yeah. are related to the Messiah. Uh, actually, the three most quoted are related to the Messiah, Messianic. But yeah, those are the most quoted in the New Testament. Okay, Brother Dwayne. Can you give me at least one or two authors in the Psalms? One of these is a gimme. Well, uh, David, obviously. Uh, yeah, he wrote. And then we've also we talked about Moses. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we have Moses, who wrote Psalm 90. Uh, well, I suppose Solomon, Solomon must have did something there. He did. He wrote, mm. I think he wrote two. I know he wrote Psalm 127. He wrote two. I think he wrote another one, but I don't remember. Mm. Let me see if I have in my notes. Ah, yeah, I do. Psalm 72. And we we see that from in the title. The Song of Ascent mm. of Solomon. Mm. And then Psalm 72. Mm. Mm -hmm. of Solomon. We'll talk about the titles uh, next time we gather. But uh, any other authors come to mind? Yeah, Asaph. Yeah, Asaph wrote Psalms, uh, let's see, I have down here, 73 mm -hmm. to 83 and Psalm 50. And then, yeah, the sons of Korah. Oh, sons, sons Korah. 10. Um, yeah, Psalms, I got here 42, 44 to 49, 485. How many is that? Four, five, and six is mm -hmm. 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the sons of Korah, those are actually, who knows who the, who these guys are? In fact, it's interesting that uh, it seems to be a restoration of the line of Korah. Yeah, remember mm -hmm. Korah's rebellion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. In uh, I just was reading that in uh, in Numbers, Korah's rebellion, where his you know he was he rebelled against Moses, and then the earth mm. opened up and swallowed him and his family, but not mm. all of his family, because there were some descendants of Korah who actually yes. were appointed as singers in the temple, choir mm. directors, singers. So they were part of the tribe of Levi, and actually God did preserve a remnant of that family who ended up some of them ended up actually writing inspired scripture mm -hmm. all right good now there's a couple of other guys uh, jeduthun himan um Ethan wrote uh each wrote a psalm mm -hmm. so they were individual authors but obviously david is the wrote the bulk of the psalms he wrote at least half, maybe a slightly more than half that we know of. There are several psalms. There's about, I think, 30-something psalms that are called orphan psalms that don't have an author uh, listed. Mm -hmm. So some of those may have been from David or someone else. We don't know for sure. Um, and then finally, well, well, we'll end there. We'll talk about the structure of the psalms and uh, more details next week, but... It's an interesting book. I think it's a, a favorite book of many just because uh, it really connects to us in so many different ways. 
Mm. Yeah, I'll never forget when Denver preached one of the last messages uh, at the Shepherds Conference, and he uh, preached and read a hundred Psalm hundred nineteen. Were you there for that? Yes. Uh, yeah, that was probably one of the most. Uh, what do you say? Uh, memorable uh, messages I ever heard. Yeah. Yeah, and as he got to about, you know, verse 30 or verse 40, he says, for those of you wondering, yes, I'm going to read the whole psalm. So <laughs> I remember seeing that. He took about 20 minutes or so, but yeah, it was great. Just sort of gave us a big picture of the of that psalm. Um all 176 verses. Yeah, the Gothard uh, people have and several others have put that to music. And when I came up here, I uh, um, kept my uh, wits together. I was alone and I just lost my wife. And uh, <clears throat> that really was a blessing. And it helped me uh, get through that eight year dark period of uh, being a widower, the 119th set to music. Wow. That was a blessing. We're still doing it. But uh, yeah, that was a very, very what do you say, uh, encouraging affair. Oh, yeah. I think the Psalms are able to connect to us or we connect to them in, in a unique mm -hmm. way compared to any other book because, you know, many of them pour out the heart of the psalmist in times of, of sorrow and grief and challenges and trials. So we're going to spend, I'd like to spend some time next week as we gather, Lord willing, just go through the structure of the Psalms and some of the details, important features of the Psalms uh, in order to help us in as we interpret the Psalms in particular. And there will be features in the Psalms that will help us understand poetry and other books as well. But the Psalms are a special case and I think deserve uh, special attention for us as studying the poetic genre. So, but we'll go ahead and end here. And then Lord willing next week, pick up again at this point. All right, are there any 